Yeah, hi there, <coughs> and welcome here to Seismic Radio. Um, rapture in 2024, that is um, the question I'm asking here. Uh, I just want to go through um, a few, um, not slides, but a few uh, captures I've got here on, on my browser, and just discuss this question. There's been an awful lot of stuff of people who on the internet are saying, you know, rapture is imminent, it's 2024. And um, I'm going to go a little bit through the uh, the whole idea of where where this is coming from and and the way we should you know as mature Christians deal with. Also, you may be wondering what is this rapture talk all about. I'm going to go th uh, through it as well very quickly to to let you know what the rapture is all about. Okay, I've got my uh, pages here. Let me just see whether I can. Okay, first of all, the problem. Yeah. Um, you can see this here, possible uh, prophecy timelines converge for possible rapture 2024, 20, and that's what's going on in YouTube. Jesus gave me a warning, rapture dream 2024. It doesn't necessarily say that he says it will be happening in 2024, but that it happened, you know, that he had this dream in 2024. Rapture alert, the time is close. Um, the scoffers are wrong and have unwittingly fulfilled prophecies. Uh, by the way, this is not a scoffing attempt. I'm I'm convinced that the rapture is is imminent whatever imminent means um it's gonna come it's gonna happen will it happen in 2024 i don't know um could happen there's there's nothing to stop it from happening uh a guy who was quite a, a an eminent preacher by the name of david jeremiah so um he has made this statement as well um and and certainly i wouldn't um wouldn't knock it Rapture will be May 18th, so that's five days from now on 2024. I I, I hope he's right, and I hope uh, I'll be found worthy to be uh, to escape all these things, according to Matthew. And I would be more than happy to exit on May 18th, 2024. Uh, is it going to happen on May 18th, 2024? I don't know. I I don't know. I, if it doesn't happen, is it gonna gonna move me or make me um, make me angry or anything like this? Certainly not. You know, twenty twenty four rapture. Somebody else makes the the point here. They look at the data twenty thirty one. I'm going to talk about this in a minute as well, where this this date comes from. I've got my own ideas, and and will I, am I right? Am I not right? It's not substantiated. Uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, we've got rapture is about to happen. Um, yeah. Uh, nothing to say that um, somebody lots of rapture dreams people have got and this could just be uh, supernatural yeah that God is telling people be ready you know the time is up or um, it could just be a hype it could be some mass um, hysteria to, to some extent because people are talking about it it's a bit like net zero and uh, climate change and Futures for Fridays, people talk about it, and, and suddenly um, there's some sort of mass hysteria which takes place, and it, it's got no founding in reality. Whereas the rapture, I have to say, there is some founding in reality. There's this term convergence which came up here, and that means just the, the number of signs which are coming together, pointing to the return of Christ and to the next big event, which is um, the tribulation period. There, there is an awful lot happening here. And when you go, I'm, I'm a little bit of a history buff. So when you go through through history and you go through the centuries, there was there was always something going on, um, where where people thought this is the end. Yeah. Um, for example, in in 1666, you had the plague and it, it ravaged Great Britain, uh, England in particular. A lot of people died. Um, I, f I find it sometimes quite sad when you um, drive through the countryside. Here in England, you've, obviously you've got your centers of population, but you've got the countryside as well, and you see a church in the middle of nowhere. And very often, when you like a, a church built of brick, you know, very nice and everything in the middle of nowhere, many of them are still in use, but there's nobody living anywhere near it. And you would think, why would you build a church where there are no people, unless you know something happened there? Uh, uh, who knows? But. But when you sort of, very often when you dig in history, uh, you find out that uh, there used to be a settlement and there was a village around the church, but they all died during the plague. And uh, there were several periods, and one of them was in the 1600s. Now, in 1666, there was a great fire of London, um, and apparently the fire could be seen from 
from miles away uh, outside of London. And, um, and, and then the plague just stopped. And, and you might have been forgiven to think, you know, you've got 666, you've got the plague, you've got sort of Armageddon, people are dying right, left and center, you've got mass graves all over, you've got villages that have been ravaged to the point that no one has survived and the only witness of the ever having anybody live there is uh, the church spire, which is still standing as a witness, you know, proclaiming of what happened. And and people could, they were forgiven to think, you know, that the uh, the end has come, you know, and Jesus is coming back because this is so terrible. Nobody can survive. But, you know, you had a bit of a reset. And then um, in the latter part of the 17th century, so after 1666, um, uh, things got better as well. It sort of people regrouped. They got married again. They produced children. Um, um, there was lots of land available now. There was no pressure on, um, on agriculture. Um, there weren't that many wars either uh, at that time so so there was quite a you know a relaxing time and, and people could could start again and that's pretty much what happened we will find the same after the tribulation period as well where the reign of christ will will come here on earth and um and there's going to be a reset and there's going to be a good time for about a thousand years of people living and 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 living you know well um Okay, we've got some more, you know, in um, 2024, in May. So, um, is there something on the agenda? Uh, what have you got here? Timeline, rupture timeline. Could it be? Yeah. Um, I think that we've seen the guy before. We've got some other bits as well. Okay. Anyway, the point I'm making is a lot of people say rupture in 2024. Yeah. Um, and I want to, you know, provide an answer to it and how should we deal with this as Christians. And um, and also, where should you be, you know, before God? Should you be worried about it? Should you, um, should you, you know, max out your credit cards and wait for the rapture to come? Um, and, and the answer is certainly not. Don't, don't, don't go stupid. Don't do any crazy stuff. If anything, um, try and walk closer with God, you know. Don't try and live it up. You know? I mean, the worst thing is, you know, the rapture, rapture comes and... You are not right with God. You have never come to an understanding of the gospel. And um, and then you find yourself in the so-called tribulation time where the wrath of God is poured out on all mankind. And that's that's going to be heavy. Okay, let's have a look about this whole rapture thing. Um, where does it come from? And uh, okay, let me... My internet is a bit slow at the moment. So it's a bit of a problem. Okay, let's have a look. And so when we find here, so this is Paul, and he's talking to the Corinthians, and we've got sort of two direct references to the rapture, possibly four or five, which are a little bit, um, you know, encrypted, hidden. And we've got it here at verse 51. Let's have a look. Starting from here. Um, and Paul says here, listen, I'll tell you a mystery. So this is all about the resurrection and the dead. You know, people have died and they thought because they missed the coming of Christ, even in the first generation of Christianity, people were living in the expectation of Christ's return. And and I'm, I made this point very often, and I think people were justified. I'm going to look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, you know, about the end times. He, he said that when the gospel is being preached to all nations, uh, then the end will come. And, and when you look at the first generation, they, they almost made it. You know, I've been to a place in Pakistan where, where Thomas is... Um, told to have been stood and preached the gospel to, you know, on the Indian subcontinent. He went all the way to southern India, and there are, there are places now who claim that um, that their, that their uh, tradition or their, um, their origins go all the way back to Thomas 2,000 years ago when he was preaching there. So that is a claim they make. So they, uh, obviously, they've got some reverence for the guy, you know, to go all the way to India to tell their forefathers about the gospel. Um, we had we had you know people going into into Russia uh, like this the Scythians yeah, uh, into Europe uh, and all over the place. So the gospel, you could almost think that yeah, it's it's about to happen. Yeah, maybe the first, second, fourth generation, and they were justified in thinking yeah, you know Jesus is coming back. And there was also this rumor going around that uh, that Jesus will return in in the lifetime of. Uh, the, the Apostle John, 
um, we can read this in the gospel according to John that, 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 that Jesus said to Peter, you know, what is it to you, you know, if, um, uh, you know, if I come back, you know, if I return, you know, b before he dies and, and, um, uh, not making the statement that he will return, but but people thought maybe there was more to it. Yeah. So there was always this, this expectation of Christ's return, and there's nothing wrong with that because ultimately um, you have to to bear in mind that that on a personal level, right to you, you know, you could um, you know suffer a heart attack as I speak, or you know a day after I talk or whatever, and you will stand before the throne of God. I I, I remember a guy called Wilhelm Busch, an amazing pastor who got to Christ in the First World War, and um, and his moment of conversion, he, he described it. What happened is uh, they were at the front line, and it, it's, when you are in war, it's pretty heavy. And if you happen to listen from the Ukraine or somewhere else, you probably can relate to that. Yeah. A war is, is heavy. It's a nasty business. It's a dirty business. And anyway, you don't care about anything because, you know, this could be your last day. Yeah. This is sort of the mentality. And, and anyway, um, Bush and his, his friend, and he was sort of in his early 20s, uh, they were sitting behind a, behind a, um, um, a, a shield yeah, where, they, um, where they were uh, sort of pushing artillery fire over to the other line. And, and anyway, uh, so his mate was just telling him a dirty joke. And, um, and then as he was telling him this dirty joke, he was hit in the heart by shrapnel, and he was dead instantly. Bush, William Bush, he realized um, that this, this, you know, this mate is right now. He's standing in the presence of God, you know, telling him his dirty joke, and it it really freaked him out, and he he came to to a decision to follow Christ. He later became a pastor, and he was very effective, and um, he became quite. Um, quite a, an awkward fellow during the Nazi time because the Nazis didn't like him at all. Uh, he stood up and he, uh, he started preaching the gospel and he um, reprimanded the Nazis for what they were trying to do. And he was a thorn in the flesh in the eyes of the Nazis and they, they incarcerated him several times. And, uh, but he made it. He made it through the war. He survived. A lot of other pastors who, who stood up against the Nazis say, they ended up and died in concentration camps. Um, anyway, um, I'm trying to make a point here, and uh, I've lost my truck a little bit. Um, so we don't know about when death is going to hit us. And so living in the expectation of the return of Christ, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's justified as well. As far as the rapture, and I'm going to look at the rapture now and these two main scriptures which point to that. As far as the rapture is concerned, um, there's no prerequisite in the Bible. There's a prerequisite for the Antichrist to turn up. There's a prerequisite for Christ's return. We're going to look at some of those bits in a minute. Um, there, there are prerequisites. There are, there are things which have to happen before the last things can, can take place. But for the rapture, nothing has to be there. All, all, all there is is, um, you know, the time is right and we go. Um, I mean, Jesus says something um, peculiar in Matthew 24, or, you know, specific, which is that the end will come after the gospel has been preached to all nations. And as I said, like in the first generation, we always hit it. Then there was some, um, there were always attempts to preach the gospel, and the gospel was always spreading, but um, but there were problems. Yeah, We didn't hit certain bits, like, um, till, till about the 16th, 17th century, when the whole missionary endeavor started again and uh, was revamped, and this was after a break of possibly about a thousand years, yeah. we had m big missionary efforts all the way uh, to uh, the Middle Ages or the medieval times, but uh, but then they just uh, stopped for quite some time, and uh, then they, they they were rebooted and they started again uh, in earnest. Uh, we can say today that pretty much, depending on how you define nations, the gospel has been preached to all nations, even down to individual tribes where you could say, you know, they've got their own laws, their own rules, their own structure, but they live inside a nation. For example, Brazil, you've got a lot of people living in the in the Amazons, who are pretty much uh, outside of the control of the state, uh, but they've got their own laws, their own rules, their own jurisdiction, uh, and you might say it's a nation within a nation. Yeah. But even a lot of those nations have been reached. A lot of those people 
who are living in in uh, in the jungle. Uh, even the Sentinel Islands, which was supposed to be the last uh, the last set of people who were untouched, and and they were very violent. They didn't want anybody on the islands. The UN said these have to be protected, and you can see straight away that this is like a ploy of the devil. Yeah, that um, that these guys were not allowed to be approached in any way whatsoever. But um, there was a guy in America and he um, felt the call of God upon his life to preach the gospel to these these people. And he, he died in the process. They killed him. Um, but the gospel is being preached to these people. He They didn't want to listen. They rejected him, but it's being preached. So we are certainly there, or if not very, very close, that the gospel is being preached to all nations, that this is being fulfilled. We're going to look at Matthew 24 in a minute, yeah, and we're going to look at something. But first of all, look, look at the scripture here, and I'm going to look at the other scripture in Thessalonians. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flush in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and uh, we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Uh, when perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with Im immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has swallowed up in victory. Okay, so what we find is um, the death, the dead will rise and then we all will be changed. And, um, and that is sort of the first, you know, something happens. Last trumpet, twinkling of an eye, you know, in a moment, like, yeah, I'm just uh, flipping my uh, fingers here. Um, so, trumpet will sound, that will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. Uh, and this refers to Christians, not to the, the godless. Okay, let's have a look at the second scripture here in Thessalonians, which talks about this particular event. And uh, let's, oh, here we go. Loads are back in again. I thought the brother would just keep it um brothers and sisters we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve uh, let me just get the new king james version here we go uh, ah yeah new king james I find that the New King James Version is a little bit more precise. Uh, let's have a look. Did we, which version did we have here? Is it New International? Yeah, New International Version as well. Let me just see. New King James Version, whether there's any, any difference. Um, it goes back to the King James. The King James was a very good translation. Um, but English has changed over time. And um, and so they just modified the, the language. But sort of try to stay close to the original, um, let's have a look, 51. For the trumpet will sound, uh, sorry, okay, behold, I tell you a mystery. Yeah. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be, uh, must put on incorruption. Okay, so we've got that. Let's have a look here. Um, so that's the, the second scripture, and it's in Thessalonia, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until coming the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So it's pretty clear that both scriptures they talk about the same event. Um, and there's an event which um, will happen where the dead in Christ will rise and it's probably, you know, at the end of time and God says, right, the gospel has been preached to our nations. Some people have received it. Most people haven't. Um, it's, it's done. It's over. Uh, and then the judgment of God is being poured out on, on all of mankind for 
rejecting such a great salvation. Let me just go one step further and um, uh, one chapter further in Thessalonians uh, 5. And I can see the internet is really slow, but uh, anyway, we shan't be faced by it. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord uh, so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety and then the sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon pregnant women, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are, sh you are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on breastplate of faith, and love as the helmet of hope and salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Okay, this is a little bit um, about what... Um, uh, what Paul is telling us. So just to sum it up, we are not... First of all, it comes as a thief in the night, but we are not in darkness. Yeah? And this day shouldn't overtake us as a thief. So we should really be in a good relationship with God and, um, and, and be alert to it. So what these guys are doing, you know, these rupture dreams, it's not wrong. Yeah? They s it's good to remind one another, you know, it, it could happen any time now and probably more today than any time before in history because of the whole issue of convergence. Yeah? So you see this magic word here as well, Converge 2024, um, which is, you know, all the stuff and all the things which are sort of coming together and which um, uh, tell us that, uh, you know, the end is coming near. Okay, right. Let me uh, just go on to Matthew 24. So this is the, the end time speech of, of Christ. Um uh, again, Jesus reminds us, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels uh, in heaven, but my Father only. But it's in the days of Noah, so also be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving into marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark, did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Hmm. This sounds interesting as well. That's probably the third witness to the rapture here. Um, two women will be grinding the mill, one will be taking the other left. Watch therefore, that, uh, for you do not know what the hour, uh, what at hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son, is man, for the son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay. Right, so, so that's the rapture. So just to sum it up, uh, and most of you, if you're a Christian, you've heard about this before. I don't need to tell you about this stuff. Um, you know it all. You know this is a rapture. The rapture is taking place. Um, it is, um, I personally believe in the pre of rapture. So it's, um, it's coming at, at some stage. Yeah. We'll be uh, taken away. Just uh, knock the keyboard there. We'll be taken away. We will um, meet the, um, the Lord, our Lord in the air. Uh, after that, we'll, we'll have a great time. We will not face those, you know, who are transformed, being alive, and not face death in the physical form, but we'll be changed. Yeah. Those who have died before us, they'll be re reunited with their bodies, but their bodies will be in perfection. So they won't be, uh, you know, marred by imperfection, problems, sickness, illness, disease, disability, or anything like that, but they will be raised in perfection. Okay, so we have, we have established that. Right, so about the timing, and this is where <coughs> where a lot of people take this. So now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. So surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So this is the fig tree. Okay, there's now a lot of interpretation which goes into this. Uh, the first one, it says the fig tree stands for the nation of Israel. Now, let me see whether I can call up a calculator. 
and this is what um, sort of the proponents of rupture in 2024, what they are saying. So Israel is, um, the, the foundation of the state of Israel was 1948. Yeah, let's put it in here, 1948. Okay, the big question people ask themselves, and by the way, I don't go along with this. Uh, I don't think, again, I think rupture can take any time. You know, it can take place, you know, 10 years before the tribulation time. It can take place, um, theoretically, 100 years before the tribulation time. There's, from what I can see in the Bible, there's no timing that says that, um, that, uh, that something has to happen before the rupture takes place. Yeah. Um, the, the only argument could be that the end will come, you know, until th this gospel has been preached to all nations. Um, anyway, what these people are saying is, um, we've got 1948, the Bible talks about a generation, and a generation is between 70 and 80 years. So let's do the, um, do the 70 year uh, thing. Uh, so we're going to click on plus uh, 70 so you can see what the numbers come up with. So that's 2018. Yeah. So it doesn't work. 2018 is gone, is passed, nothing has happened. So it doesn't work. Okay. Right. Uh, let's see. Go 1948. And let's put in plus 80. And then we come to... Um, 2028. Yeah. No, we've got 2024. Why should the rupture be taking place now? So the argument is quite interesting. Interesting point. Yeah. Uh, the argument is that um, the fig tree always stands for Israel as a nation. Israel has only been a nation several times. And uh, one was under David and King Solomon. Uh, I would contend Saul goes in there as well. So it was a nation under King Saul. Um, then it was a nation... Um, during the Maccabeans. The Maccabeans, I think the, um, I was listening to a Jewish rabbi and he said that the period lasted about 73 years. So some people say, oh, it's near enough 80 years, one generation. Um, under David and Saul was about um, um, 80 odd years as well, possibly if you put the period of Saul in there. And so they take this period and they think, okay, this must be a generation. So this might refer to whatever's happening now as well. Yeah. And then we've got in the Bible that, uh, you know, what is the age of man is um, um, three score, t 10 or four score, if they have the strength. Um, and so they, they look at 80 years as a generation. Then in, in other instances, and, and I've heard all this many, many years ago, the people said, oh, a generation is 40 years or 25 years and so on. But, um, but you have to look at the text and see what Jesus is saying here. Yeah, that's very, very important. Um, okay, so I wouldn't stick with these 80 years. Again, the idea is, so it's 2028. Um, the Antichrist will sit himself in the temple and de um, and um, desecrate the temple after three and a half years. So the Jews will see the Antichrist and they will say, oh, he's a great guy, you know, and possibly accept him as their Messiah. Then they realize that he is not their Messiah, that he is uh, an imposter. He'll put himself into the temple and... Um, you know, call himself to be God, and uh, and that is about three and a half years in into this this treaty he makes with with the nation of Israel, this treaty of peace. Okay, so if you take this twenty twenty eight and then you subtract three and a half years, so you come to um, twenty twenty five, yeah, and then you don't know where to locate this in twenty twenty five, so uh, you have to. Um, um, subtract half a year and you might end up somewhere in 2024 yeah. maybe towards the end of 2024 so it could start and kick in from June, July 2024, you know, six months in and then um, obviously it could, could develop but you have to bear in mind there's, um, um, if the rapture takes place there still has to be the rise of the Antichrist, there has to be uh, you know, the, the peace treaty which he makes and, and from the time that he makes a peace treaty, from what we read in the Bible, it it carries on. Yeah. So then the countdown goes. Okay, could it happen? As I said before, it could happen at any time. A thief in the night, we, we don't know exactly when it goes. Only the Father knows the day and the hour. Uh, so I don't stand here and I say, I, I have got any idea of when it's going to take place, when it's going to happen. And anybody who stands up and 
makes these claims, I would say, don't believe it. It's it's not happening. It's not there. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I tend to think, and this is the, the other, that's my... And there's no proof for it. I have to say this before I go on, but it would just nicely fit in if if it was happening, if it was the case. Um, but the Bible doesn't 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 support it. Yeah. Not directly. There's no statement. There's no prophecy in the Bible that, that this timeline has got anything to do with this. But it it would just kind of work out. And and we are. I mean, one thing is is sure. We are very very close. Um, and the whole idea is that uh, the countdown is from either uh, Pentecost or uh, the death of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. And then we count down 2,000 years from there. So if we, we come you know, to this conclusion, um, and again, we don't have any clear dates. So the, uh, the countdown dates are 30, 33, and then it can s go up to about 36. And this is where Pilate, where we know Pilate was moved from Jerusalem to uh, away back to Rome uh, we know a couple of other dates as well so it's unlikely that it's um, you know anywhere near 36 so 33 seems to be um, the, the the right date for the crucifixion of Christ if we if you take that one uh, and we take uh, 33 as the return of Christ and Jesus said that the dates were going to be shortened otherwise no flesh would survive um, so we are looking at um, 20 Six, um, 2026 of being, um, you know, the time when it all kicks off. Um, if it works out, could it be longer? Could it be shorter? Let's have a look and see what the text says. And this is where we know if the fig tree is Israel, and if if we take as the the guideline, the um, the proclamation of the state of Israel in 1948 and the beginning, and I wouldn't say the fig tree is blooming, so it could be sometime later than that. Um, that generation will not pass away. So my mother was born in in um, 1939. So she died recently. She was 82 years old. Yeah, a few years ago she died. Um, so. You could, so if you assume, you know, people are going to be around to the, in the early hundreds, um, <clears throat> then this would um, push it all up another 20 years, possibly even 30 years, uh, depending if you take, you know, people born in 1948 and, and that is your, uh, you know, how long are these people going to be around? Um, there's going to be um, the date in, you know, still 30 years ahead potentially yeah. so we we don't know yeah this, this is the point i'm trying to make here i'm not trying to postpone the the um the uh the date of the rapture or push it back my my message to you is expected to happen today be right with god today yeah whatever whatever the situation is the next message is if it doesn't happen in 24 and you listen to all these guys who make predictions about uh, 2024 being the date of the rapture and I've, I've seen this for the last um, 40 50 years that there were predictions being made all the time and then obviously it didn't happen it didn't occur the rapture didn't take place and and people look like uh, you know having egg on their face and um, and I think it's a ploy of the enemy as well that uh, people get convinced about a certain idea and um, and they come up with certain elements you know as, as Astronom astrologically or astronomically, you know, with the stars, uh, constellation and, and things like that. Or, you know, certain events like lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, red moons and, and so on. Um, and then they come up with something. And, and I'm, I'm not saying ignore this. Yeah. Look at this and, and maybe it is a sign, but it shouldn't really change your attitude towards the return of Christ. Your attitude should be, be ex expectant. Yeah. It could be tomorrow. Live like it could be tomorrow. You know, if, if you've got somebody you want to share the gospel with, pray for a good opportunity. Pray for the right moment and go for it. Yeah, share the gospel with that person because you don't know whether um, the rapture will be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or in two years or in five years or in ten years or in twenty years. You don't know. Yeah, and we, we all don't know. Uh, is it near? It's no doubt about it. It's very near. And I believe that uh, when I look at the world, when I look at the um, the constellation of how everything has been sort of set out and laid out, 
um, that we are indeed very, very close. And uh, that I think the only reason why we are still here is by the grace and mercy of God. Uh, I was praying about this uh, some time ago, and and uh, one thing I felt God was was saying is 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 one more day, you know, because there's still some souls who who need to come in, who need to come home. Just one more soul, one more soul, one more soul. Yeah, and and that was the sense I had that 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 it is purely and truly by the grace and mercy of God that. Um, that this event, you know, this final event where it said, right, come home, that's it. Um, where this is pushed on more and more and more. Because God wants to save people. He doesn't want people to, to die in hell or to be condemned forever, for eternity. He wants to save people. And if you are, if you are not one of us, if you are not one of those who belong to Jesus Christ, this is your time to surrender your life to Jesus Christ to just say Jesus if all this stuff is real you know I want to know please please reveal yourself to me let me know about this stuff give me some some true divine understanding of whatever is taking place here and uh, and then you know receive receive the gospel for yourself and before I finish here I just want to to let you know what is the gospel message message the gospel message is very very simple um it is um, 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 it is that, that we none of us are right before God. We're all sinners. We're not right. We've done stuff which is wrong in the eyes of God. Maybe okay you know, in the eyes of man, but it's not okay in the eyes of God. And there's not one of us who's righteous, not, not one, not one who can stand before God. I, I always use this example about uh, sort of I live by myself and I'm not... A clean freak or something, but um, I always thought my curtains in front of my living room window they were they were clean, they were white, they're sort of beige color, whitish color. They were they were clean. And then one day, uh, and normally I, I don't notice it because I go to work in the morning, I come back in the evening, so I, I don't see it in sort of daylight. But one day there was a really sunny day, and the sun was hitting the window, and the first thing I realized is that the window was really dirty and it <laughs> desperately needed washing. And then the second thing I realized is that the curtains were very dirty as well, and they desperately needed washing too. And and I saw stains and dirt and dust and, and stuff on my curtains, which I'd never seen before, but I could only see it in the light. And this is the same thing if you stand unforgiven in the light of God. You know exactly what your fate is. You will condemn yourself because you will not be able to stand the righteousness and the, the nearness of God. But there's a way out, and this way out is that uh, somebody who was righteous, somebody who has never done anything wrong, somebody who, you know, is actually God, came into this world, became flesh, became like one of us, lived a perfect life, and then sacrificed, surrendered his life as the ultimate sacrifice for um, all the things you and I have done wrong and for all the punishment you and I deserve. And, and if we receive this and we say, Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you have died for my sin, that you are the Messiah, that you are the Son of God, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that no one can come to the Father except through you. If you believe this stuff, and if you can uh, receive it and accept this, and if you are willing to, to live a life that is pleasing to God. So, again, it's not you know, breaking yourself to, to try to... Uh, fit in with what you think God wants you to be. You know, the the thing is you need a change in your heart. But it's a willingness to allow God to move in your life, to pour out his Holy Spirit into your life and to um to let him change you from the inside out. Uh, and the Bible calls this sanctification or making you holier. You know, we are called in the Bible saints, so if you are Catholic this uh, would be very strange to you that ordinary normal Christians are called saints. But that is that you are sanctified and that you are made holy through through Jesus Christ and that you are given a new chance, a new life, a new beginning and that you can walk the rest of your life together with God. But Jesus says in, in, in John chapter 5 that if you believe in him, you will not see death, but you have crossed over from death to life. Yeah. You've already died. You've already died in, in Christ because you've started a new life and the old life is gone. It's an amazing stuff, and if, if you read the Bible, you will understand more and more about this great salvation God has done. And this is the thing as well when we talk about the end times. God is um, God is coming to a point 
where he has made this great offer and he's calling out to all of mankind. Um, but Jesus says, come, come, come to me, all you who are, uh, who are thirsty and who are heavy laden, who are hungry. Uh, I will give you drink, I will give you food, I will, I will set you free. This is what Jesus says and this is a call that's going out to mankind. And um, lay down your burdens at the cross of Christ and, uh, and be set free from your sin, from all the stuff that separates you from God. And then you can be right with God. And if people reject this, and the gospel has been sort of going out throughout the whole world and people reject it, then the end will come. Um, okay, we uh, let's have a look. I'm just looking for the scripture here where it says... Um, this is the one, uh, Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and that the end will come. Okay, and, and let me just dwell on this scripture here for a moment. I just want to let you know the Bible has been translated. I don't know how many languages, but um, I know in, in the year, in the 90s, I was intending to work for um, for uh, a Christian organization that is broadcasting the gospel and, and the job was that by the year 2000 to find out and um, and um, you know get to know small tribes where uh, there are 2,000 or less people like language groups with 2,000 or less <coughs> <clears throat> this was all about the year 2000. That, that was sort of the vision they had. To reach out to them and to <clears throat> make them produce uh, radio broadcasts preaching the gospel in their own language. So this is how, how far it went down. So we've been looking since the, the 1940s, 50s that um, the gospel has been spread with shortwave radio. Then the internet came. They think internet pr proliferation has... Um, it's almost there where, where radio was um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that pretty much everybody had a radio and people could listen to, um, to broadcasts. Um, the gospel is being preached in all sorts of languages. Um, there are about 200 and something nations on the world, depending on how you define a nation. Um, pretty much all nations have been reached. Sub-nations have been reached as well. Um, a lot of people are active on social media, preaching the gospel. Bibles are available in numbers like they've never been before. Um, and um, and it's, all, it's all happening. It's all happened. Yeah. So we are at this, this point, and, and he says, um, let me repeat this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This gospel of the kingdom preached in all the world, witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay. So we are there. The end will come. It's never happened before. People were justified in thinking that the end will come because uh, in the Roman era, people didn't realize that there was still Australia and uh, the Americas. They knew about China. They knew about Russia. They knew about Persia. They knew about Africa. But... Um, they weren't quite sure about you know what was lying further beyond and people were living there um the generation thing again don't be fooled by it it's not necessarily 80 years jesus said that this generation will not pass away first world war is sort of a guideline um, um i think the last guy who fought in the first world war died about five years ago and they reckon he was somewhere in australia Again, we don't know because a lot of people are vegetating away in nursing homes. Nobody knows their story. Some of them might have been in the First World War. But, but we can say that there's a time when none of the generation is going to be left. There might still be some people who are 110, 115 or whatever, who are very old and um, are still around you know, from the First World War. So again, it's um, 1915 when it started, finished 1918. Uh, so if you were born in 19, uh, if you were taking part in the war, and uh, you were born, let's say, as a 16-year-old in the war, so 1902, 
Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that nobody is alive. Yeah. There might still be one or two around nobody really knows about, but um, the generation is almost past. The war before that was in 1870, and I can tell you for sure that nobody is around who was in that war. That generation has passed away. It doesn't exist anymore. 1948, <coughs> um, if you take the birth date, uh, you can still th think about 2048. Uh, people will be 100 years old then. It's not that long long to go, to be, to be fair. Um, so again, the, just get, don't get me wrong. I'm not sort of minimizing all those end-time prophecies and predictions. I believe we are very, very close. The point I'm trying to make is, um, if it doesn't happen, don't be disappointed. If people start mocking because, and this is a problem, because we are making these claims and it hasn't happened, then um, don't be dis discouraged because it will happen. Also, when you look at all the timelines, which some of them are given, and we are told, you know, in Matthew 24, to um, to look at the signs of the time. Uh, it's not Matthew 24, but it's, it's elsewhere in the Bible. I'm just thinking where the scripture is. You know, you can judge the clouds and you tell the weather, and you know, oh, tomorrow it's going to be raining or it's going to be a dry day, but you cannot recognize the times. You cannot discern the times. And Jesus was talking about the time of him being there now, but we also need to discern the times of him coming back. And, and the Bible is full of prophecies, full of predictions, and we are encouraged to read them and to take them in and to, um, to take them to heart as well. What we shouldn't do is, you know, come up with a, you know, a date or whatever with uh, some magical calculations. But um, we should know the times and we should be aware of the times. We should be discerning people. And one thing I believe we can discern is, and that is that uh, the return of Christ is near, that the rapture is very, very near. And, and as I said, it could be today, it could be, it could be in 2048 or 2050 or 2052. I don't know. It could be happening. It could be happening straight away. So don't be fooled to think it's not going to happen for a long time. And don't be fooled to think it'll happen guaranteed this year. It's not guarantee. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Might happen, might not happen. I hope it does happen, but uh, we don't know. Okay, so be sober-minded. That's my advice to you. Uh, be um, alert. Look at the signs of the times. You know, watch the news, see what's going on. Observe. But also, don't let it frighten you, but rather let it encourage you to walk closer with your God and to, to intensify your relationship with God, to seek your first the kingdom of God and all these other things, like whatever you need for living, whatever you need for life, whatever you need for your soul, whatever you need, you know, as nourishment for your soul, will be given unto you. This is, this is what the Bible says. Seek your first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. What, what this means in particular is between you and God. What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? It could be that you um, preach the gospel, that you reach, reach out with the gospel to people who are not saved. It could be that you just do a kind deed. It could be that you go through your day and you're just a friendly person, a person people like to hang out with. It could be that you are the most forgiving person in, in, in your workplace, in your sphere. It could be that you are a light that you are a light that shines in the darkness. And, and I'm just going to, two, three thoughts. I had today, I was reading something in Romans, and um, they talked a little, little bit about the light and what we should be. And, and um, actually, no, it was gospel according to John, the light and the darkness, that the darkness will, will not behold it. Anyway, I have to think about one thing, and this is um, when you've got a light and you've got a snowy environment like there's snow all over a little bit of light even starlight without moon or something will make the whole pl whole place visible you can see a lot uh, but when it's uh, and, and you may have noticed this when it's raining and you're driving in your car and the tarmac uh, you know the asphalt gets really dark with the rain even darker than normal and there's virtually no reflection and it seems like there's darkness all the way around that the darkness tries to swallow the light and, and here's the thing, the darkness will not overcome the light. On the contrary, if the environment is really, really dark and it tries to absorb 
all of the light, when you look towards the light, it'll be brighter, it'll appear brighter to you than, than it's ever been. You just don't get any reflection from it with the darkness. So the darkness will not overcome the light. Yeah. And that is what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be light in this world, uh, a signpost pointing to the Almighty God, to the gospel. So it's, it's not necessarily that we throw pearls before swine, yeah, to use this parable Jesus was using, that we, you know, we try to, to forcefully convert the whole world. It's not really our job. Our job is to be witnesses, to be prepared to give an answer for the hope we have. To, um, to, but on the same side, not to, to deal with the gospel cheaply. The gospel has come with a high price, and the price is the death of Christ. And it's a pearl we have found and we are taking hold of. We don't need to give them before swine. If people don't want to know, if people reject our gospel, if people say that we are crazy, if people say that uh, uh, we are not willing to listen to you, um, figuratively, you can take off your shoes and shake off the dust of your shoes as a, as a testimony against them. So I'm not suggesting you go to work, people don't want to listen to you, take your shoes off and start clapping them and, and unless you feel that's a, the right thing to do but um, and shake off the dust as a testimony against them. But figuratively, that's really what we are supposed to, to be doing. Um, but at the same time, you know, be there. Um, if our enemy is in need, feed him. Um, if uh, or give him what they need, and um, and um, and people will see that there is this light, even if the darkness is great. They will never be able to snuff out your light. They will never be able to extinguish your light or my light. <coughs> and in great darkness, the light shines even brighter. Okay, I'm going to leave you on at this point. So my encouragement to do is do well, seek the Lord, seek your first the kingdom of God. Um, don't be worried if 2024 comes and goes and nothing has happened. We are still here. The world has still gone worse, more insane, more mad. Um, don't be discouraged. It'll come, it'll happen. <laughs> might not happen this year, might not happen next year, might not even happen in 2026 or even later than that. But it will happen. It'll come and it'll happen. And we should, you know, walk with God to do what God wants us to do. Reach out to those who are within our sphere of influence as best as we can. Not necessarily through, you know, preaching them to, to, uh, to death or whatever, but to be a witness, to be a light. To be a light in, in darkness and sometimes in deep and utter darkness. And then... Um, just hang on there and wait for the Lord to come. Wait for the Lord to come and be ready that when the call goes out and when the trumpet comes and the trumpet is blown, that you will be uh, the first one to lift your eyes up to the heavens and to, to, uh, to go with Christ, to be united with Christ and with, uh, with all of us, with the rest of us. And um, my friend, if, uh, if I'm around, if I make it, I, I believe that all believers who are genuine will make the rapture. I believe that there are a lot of Christians who aren't right with God, who have never come to repentance in their lives, who have never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, but who are just traditionalists, who are just uh, ritualists, or something like that. But um, but I may be wrong. Yeah, I'm just hoping that uh, not just the pious believers, but uh, the weak believers like myself and others as well, that we all make it, and that we will all go up to meet the Lord in the air. And... Uh, and um, if we are there and we are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb of, of Christ, then, uh, and you meet me and you see me and you will know who I am and I will know who you are, uh, it'll be my privilege to shake your hands and uh, to say, well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being faithful to my Lord and your Lord. Okay. And that's me signing off. God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio.